page 1075, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 12. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those chosen, living as exiles dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You're being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your salvation, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched and carefully investigated. They inquired into what time or what circumstances the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified in advance to the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. These things have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, The world we live in, I am told is very different to the world our parents grew up in and the world our grandparents lived in. I know that because my parents keep telling me. Everywhere we look, everywhere we look, our world, and I mean the world people like you and me live in, everywhere we look, our world seems to be more aggressively anti-God at the worst. And if not anti-God, at least non-God at the best. Who cares? I'm told that from a position of cultural security where Christians were in the majority, people who trust in Jesus now seem to be in a minority and the stream of culture, politics and even economics seems to be against God and his people. Now for some of God's mob, the response is lament, perhaps even a move into self-pity. For some of God's mob, the response is accommodation. We need to become more relevant to the culture around us. For some of God's mob, there is a circling of the wagons and a move to being inward-looking and insular. For others in God's mob, there is a reaction of outrage and they put on the armour of cultural warriors and they say, we want to return to the good old days. It would be fair to say that for most of God's mob, we're just plain confused, aren't we? We've just been wrong-footed and discombobulated by what seems to be a very fast-moving culture where what we accepted to be the truth only five years ago is now ridiculed as a myth and a fairy tale. I don't think our situation is that different to God's mob at any time when you actually dive into it, not least in the period when Jesus was around and especially after he went into heaven. Think about Jesus. How many people hung around with him in the culture he was in? I'd hazard a guess and say Jesus was never in a majority, was he? Jesus never had a political party that actually won elections. Jesus was never in a position of cultural comfort, was he? And as he left his followers and ascended to sit at the right hand of his Father in heaven, as he gave them a job to do, go and tell people that I have been raised from the dead and go and help them understand what it means to follow me. When he did that, everyone who followed him 
moved from a position of comfort to discomfort, didn't they? Whether you're a Jew or a Roman, if you became a Christian, you moved from a culture that dominated to being out on the fringes. They moved into a cultural landscape very similar to the one we're experiencing now. So wouldn't it be helpful to go and read a letter by a bloke who lived in those kind of times to help us understand these kind of times? And we're going to do that with one Peter. Let me read Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thank you for its goodness. Uh, Thanks uh, for Stephen's kids' talk. It it is good to have a living hope. It is great to be gathered as your people. It is your desire for us to exist now. Father, as we listen to Peter, help us to be encouraged to be a rejoicing people who know our identity now now and who know our future then. Father, help us to do this in such a way that others see how good you are. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline. I look at verses one and two. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those chosen, living as exiles dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Uh, There are moments where I have intense regret when I start uh, a new sermon series. I think, why have I picked this book? Uh, Why am I working? It It is so complicated. When I came to to Peter, I thought, this is going to be simple. Written by a simple fisherman, it's going to be tradey language. It's going to be. The more and more I read 1 Peter, the more and more I read, this is so deep. I hope you pick that up from the reading we had today. There are sentences that are just so complex that kind of tumble out of, of each other. And, and most people say this is the finest Greek in all of the New Testament. And for those reasons alone, most people say, well, Peter couldn't have written this. How could a bloke who is uneducated and untrained, who left school in year 10 to go and work as a fisherman, that's what we're told in Acts chapter 4 verse 13, how could a bloke with such little education write a letter like this? Now, I I don't agree with that because I actually think when you sit down and you think about Peter and who he is, you realise a bloke like that could write a letter like this. Uh, Think about his trade. He he ran a flourishing fishing business in a multicultural society where he had to deal with three languages every day. And he made a a success of it. He, He made a profit. He knows things like Greek and he can speak it to the lower class and the upper class. He's at least bilingual, perhaps even trilingual. He's a bloke who's hung out with Jesus for all of his earthly ministry. He's been with Jesus, we're told in Acts 4, verse 13. He's an apostle, an eyewitness of everything that Jesus did. Uh, Not only that, but God then gave him the Holy Spirit. So that when we get to something like Acts chapter 2, he preaches one of the most magnificent sermons in all of the Bible and he left school in year 10. And preached it in such a way that thousands came to know and love Jesus. He had a relationship with the Saviour of the world. Uh, on the one hand, that meant that he recognised who Jesus was. Remember those times where Peter goes, I know who you are, you're the Saviour of the universe. Remember that as he met Jesus face to face on the mountain in Matthew 17. And then you've got the converse, as we heard in the kids' talk, where uh, Peter always seems to engage his mouth before his brain and just blurts things out. I'm going to follow you everywhere, Jesus. And then think of his misery when he abandons Jesus at his greatest moment of need. Not once, not twice, but three times. So this man is a marvellous mix, isn't he? A marvellous mix. In fact, this man is exactly like you and me, isn't he? Exactly like you and me. Caught between two poles. I want to live in the world. I want to be part of the world. But I'm going to be following this bloke and I recognise him for who he is. This is the bloke who wrote this letter to people like us. And when he wrote this letter, he communicated it to a bloke called Silvanus, 
chapter 5, verse 12, who then wrote it down for him. So the content is Peter's. The language is Silvanus, Silas from the book of Acts. And so we get a book like this, which is amazing depths, but then is written in wonderful Greek. And Peter is just like us. We have moments where we engage our mouth before we think, don't we? We have moments where we say to Jesus, Jesus, I will follow you for the rest of my life. And what do we do at lunchtime the next day? We have moments where we say, Jesus is my Lord and Saviour. But gee, I don't want to miss out on that. He's just like us. And he writes to people just like us. Did you see the description of them there in verses 1 and 2? There are people scattered right throughout what we understand as modern-day Turkey. So look at your map, Yeah, think of modern-day Turkey, that's where we're talking about. And did you see how he described it? Each of the words Peter uses to describe God's people is deliberate. Uh, He talks about them there, see there in verse 1, as living as exiles dispersed abroad. They're foreigners. They've got temporary resident visas. And they've been flung out so they feel isolated. And when you go through the Old Testament, that's the word Abraham uses to describe himself in Genesis 23. I'm a foreigner. When David writes a poem about trusting in God, Psalm 39, he uses exactly the same word. I'm a foreigner. Why is that the case? Well, look at the other word he uses to describe God's people in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. They are living as exiled because they are chosen. That's a word only used by Peter to describe Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 4. So he's used two deliberate terms that put you in a family tree. You're a foreigner and you're chosen. And then he unpacks the chosen phrase... In three ways. Look there in verse 2. Chosen means picked by God. Who's your father? He knows everything. Chosen means you've been set apart by the Holy Spirit. Chosen means that you have a boss who's made you God's friend, who loves you so much that he will spill his blood for you. So when you stand back and look at how Peter describes his readers, not only is Peter like us, But the readers are like us. They're in God's mob. God has saved them. God has created a covenant with them. Remember Malachi? They're his mob and he's their God. They're just like Abraham. Remember him wandering around on his own, trusting in God? They're just like David who had moments of intense abandonment where he felt alone and only knew God. They're just like Jesus who was nailed to a cross, and they're scattered right throughout the world. They're exiles and they're chosen, and they stand out because when do they live? Well, they live at a time when Rome ruled the world. We're talking about the mid-AD 60s. We're talking about a time where Rome had no opposition we're talking about a time where no rival rulers were tolerated and suddenly you got a bunch of people saying, hey, no, we follow another king. His name's Jesus. Can you imagine how lonely they felt? It's about the time a bloke called Nero was ruling Rome. We've heard of Nero, haven't we? Or at least his fiddling ability. There's no systematic or systemic persecution, but everywhere these people live, dispersed, foreigners, everyone around them knows they follow another boss. And so Peter's writing to them. Peter is just like us. His readers are just like us. They belong to God. They follow in the footsteps of Jesus. What will God say to his mob through Peter? I'm at point three on the outline. It's striking that in this opening section, Peter has one command. Uh, He repeats it twice in case we missed it. It's there in verse 6, it's there in verse 8. It's a very simple word, rejoice, rejoice. In fact, it's a repeated idea right throughout this opening scene. Now, what what does the word rejoice mean? Uh, 
Stephen picked up the idea that our culture often uses Bible words differently. He used the word hope. The Bible uses the word hope very differently to our world. When we use it in our world, it's a possibility. When the Bible uses it, it's set in concrete. It's the same with the word rejoice. Our world uses the word rejoice to describe a certain bubbly happiness. That's there when the Bible talks about it. But it's far deeper than that. It's an emotion, it's a response, but it's not just having a stiff upper lip. It's not just being stoic and putting on a smile. It's not flippant. It is a deeply rooted emotion that says life is good and is contented and satisfied. And we're going to look a little bit now at why God's mob can do that in such a strange world. Uh, Peter unpacks this really deeply. We're going to move very quickly, but you'll see it there on your outline under point three. You'll see the reasons he gives. And the reasons start with a person. See there in verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The rejoicing starts with who? Starts with God, doesn't it? And notice how God is described there. He's the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you remember how we've been described, that means not only is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, but remember, we're just like Jesus, so he's our father too. We're in a community with Jesus, calling God our father. Now, our earthly experience of fathers isn't always happy, is it? It's not always smooth, and it's not always sweet and wonderful. But that's not the case with this father. This father, notice in verse 3, has great mercy. He is lavish in his kindness. And out of his kindness, he's acted on our behalf. Uh, Mercy is something you don't deserve. You never warrant mercy. You never earn it. It's actually undeserved generosity from a position of power to a position of weakness. And that's what God has done with us. God is our Father and has acted towards us in a moment and time of great kindness that we don't deserve. And then Peter unpacks what that looks like. He gives us five reasons to rejoice in what God has done. God the Father. Uh, The generosity of God the Father is seen in an astounding way in verses 3 to 5. And Steve touched on this. Look at verse 3. Because of his great mercy... He's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. You're being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. God has given you amazing certainty if you're part of his mob, all because he's been generous. Do you see that there in verse 3? God has given you, through something he has done, new birth into a living hope. Because God raised Jesus from the dead, you don't have to fear death. Because God has raised Jesus from the dead, you don't have to fear brokenness. You have been made alive because Jesus has died for your sins, taking it all upon himself. So you don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear brokenness. You can actually live now knowing that God has granted you in the resurrection of Jesus forgiveness of your sins. And so you are now truly alive. And not only does that give you something now, notice that it gives you something into the future, an inheritance. Again, you don't deserve an inheritance. How do you get an inheritance? You just live. And then you get it. It's a gift. Great mercy, it's a gift. An inheritance, it's a gift. And you are given a certain future where you will dwell with God forever. God, as our Father, has been greatly merciful. He has given people who trust in Jesus life and a future, and it is certain. Now, the problem when people hear us Christians talk about this kind of stuff is that we're actually, they actually think we're talking about something that's separate from the real world, don't they? I mean, that's perhaps what you thought when I stood up and said, well, the key theme of today is rejoice. Bernard wants us 
to have a kind of Pollyanna fake happiness that ignores the real world. But I hope you notice how Peter goes on in verse 6. You rejoice in this, what God has given you, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. Now, on one level, that seems counterintuitive. It rejoice even as you're suffering. But when you look at it more closely, you realise what Peter is saying. The suffering is to be expected. It is necessary. Shouldn't surprise us. After all, we're following a different boss. That's always going to make you stand out, isn't it? You follow a boss who suffered and died and we're identified with him. And the suffering that we experience is in light of a certain truth. You're already alive and you're certain of your future. You don't fear death. And notice too that the suffering is short. It's temporary for a little time. It's not permanent. And so when Peter is talking about suffering, he's saying, because God has given you new life and a certain future, you look at the world with different eyes. You look at the world knowing that your sins are forgiven, that your future is set because of Jesus. You don't ignore the suffering. You don't dismiss the suffering. You understand the grief of the suffering, but the suffering's put in a right perspective, isn't it? You can experience it because God has given you a certain future. In fact, that experience is a proving ground. This is the fourth reason there on your outline. That experience is a proving ground. Look there in verse 7, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which through, though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So as you deal with these sufferings, knowing what God has given you, your faith is displayed. And how precious is that faith? How's it described there? More valuable than gold. Now, I know what that means. That means that at some point I'm going to be shown to have been stubborn and persevering in my faith. I've held on to Jesus and I've been shown to be right. That's how we often read that, isn't it? Now, that would be a mistake, especially when you consider the author, because Peter never did that, did he? Every time Peter seemed to be holding on, he fell flat on his face. You just look at Peter and you realise how fragile your faith is if it's up to you. No, actually, I think what's happening here is Peter is pointing our attention to the one we have faith in and we see that he's proven okay. Because do you see how the verse ends? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, when you persevere and understand in sufferings what is going on, and when you get through them, what is proven to be valuable? Your faith or the one you have faith in? Well, the one you have faith in, he's more valuable than gold because he'll never let you down. No one can put him back in the grave or back on the cross. In fact, that one who's proven valuable is the object of all of your affections. Do you see that there in verse 8? Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So here's where we are. God has given you a new life and a certain future. That helps you understand the world you are living in and to navigate sufferings knowing who you are. And as you do that, Jesus is proven faithful and you love him more and more because of what he has done for us. He is devoted to us. He has shed his blood for us. And he is constant around us. In fact, that is why you can rejoice because of your unique place in all of world history. That's the last reason for rejoicing. Look there in verses 10 to 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that will come to you searched and carefully investigated. In fact, look down there in verse 12, angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. If you trust in Jesus, if you are part of God's mob through Jesus, you are in a unique position in all of history. 
You are experiencing what prophets wanted to see and you are enjoying what angels would love to experience. The resurrection of Jesus for your benefit. And because of that, you can rejoice. So we've skimmed through that really quickly, haven't we? If you're anything like me, my brain is still whirring about all the things I've missed and all the things I don't understand. But as Peter opens this letter, and he's just like us, writing to a group of people just like us, God's mob in the world, he wants to open with this one clear command, rejoice. And then he gives us six reasons. You'll see them there on your outline. Rejoice in God the Father, who is merciful. Rejoice in what God has given you through the resurrection of Jesus. Rejoice in the perspective this gives you on reality now. Rejoice in possessing a faith, Jesus, who is more precious than anything. Rejoice in Jesus himself. Rejoice in where you stand in history. Rejoice. Rejoice. So what will that look like tomorrow morning? When you go to work, when you go and have coffee with friends, when you go and play touch football tomorrow night, what will that look like tomorrow? Look there on the outline and I'll give you four very quick suggestions. The first one is you have a certain future because of your certain identity and that is immovable. The first thing we should do every morning is remind ourselves of who we are. Who am I? Well, I'm Bernard, I'm the husband of Anita, I'm the father of four children, I'm the vicar of Narrabri Anglican Church, I somehow managed to run five kilometres. No, none of that will enable me to get through the day, will it? Who am I? I am someone who has been given new life and a certain future because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. I belong to Jesus. I belong to God. That is my identity every day. And nothing will move it. Why? Because no one can undo the resurrection of Jesus. That's who I am. So it, that's something fairly unique in our world. Uh, you see, tomorrow, uncertainty will dominate everything. Will Sam Kerr play tonight? That will dominate tomorrow, won't it? That's so uncertain. Will Australia ever beat the All Blacks? That's, well, perhaps that's not so uncertain. Will the interest rates go up? Will I be able to get lunch for my kids? Will my pension be enough to get me through the week? Who am I? You see, uncertainty dominates every part of our world, doesn't it? It makes us anxious. It makes us angry. It disappoints us. This thing is certain. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. You belong to God. Nothing will change that tomorrow so you can rejoice. Second, the life that comes from that is praiseworthy and more precious than gold. The life that comes from that is a good life because God has deprived you of nothing and he's granted you everything. That life is good because it's established in Jesus. That life is good because it guarantees a certain future. That life is good because God has granted you everything. Now, that means that our lives will be different tomorrow. We won't need to be ashamed of Jesus, because that's often our tendency, isn't it? Do I want to talk about a bloke who others laugh at? Well, yeah, I do, because he's been raised from the dead. There's nothing to be shameful about that, is there? He gives me new life. Such a truth leads to rejoicing and not whinging. Tomorrow, will you be deprived of anything in light of this passage? You'll be deprived of nothing from God. Such a kind of life leads to an absolute joy, not a relative rejoicing. It means that you can rejoice tomorrow, not because someone else is worse off, isn't that our default say? But because you are best off because of what God has done for you. Rejoice. Thirdly, it gives you a grip on reality. And it's refreshing. It means that we can actually look at the world with a new lens. It'll recognise on the one hand the world is broken. It, that's obvious to all of us. 
and we will understand that as we dive deeper into what Jesus has done and why the world's broken, but it will also give you a perspective on why you might be rejected tomorrow for something you said about Jesus, something you did because of Jesus, something you said no to because of Jesus or yes to because of Jesus. You follow a bloke who suffered. We follow a bloke who suffered. We follow a man who was not in a cultural majority or in any position of cultural comfort. So whatever anyone throws at us tomorrow because we say we follow Jesus, we understand it, don't we? Because of the bloke we follow. And finally, we live in a great and privileged moment in history where we've seen the resurrection of the only truly perfect man and been forgiven. Why would you want to live at any other time? Why would you want to live at any other moment? Or why would you want to rage about what's been lost or whimper at what might have been? We live at a time where we know the resurrected Lord of the universe. Why would you want to live at any other moment? So what can we do tomorrow? We can rejoice, can't we, because of who we are. Let me pray. Father, you have communicated a huge amount to us today. Uh, Well, perhaps I've done that. Thank you for Peter. Thank you that he's just like us. And thank you that he writes to people just like us. Father, amidst all the ideas that have been communicated here, help us to be reminded to rejoice because of your great mercy that has granted us a new identity and the one in whom we trust, Jesus, who's been raised from the dead. Father, as the week unfolds, we pray that you'll enable us to be a rejoicing people, rejoicing because of our certain hope and future in the one who has certainly been raised from the dead. Father, as we live like this, please enable others to meet you. Amen.